This is an audio version from I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. When I was three and Bailey four, we had arrived in the musty little town wearing tags on our wrists which instructed, to whom it may concern, that we were Marguerite and Bailey Johnson Jr. from Long Beach, California, en route to Stamps, Arkansas, Miss Annie Henderson. Our parents had decided to put an end to their calamitous marriage, and father shipped us home to his mother. A porter had been charged with our welfare. He got off the train the next day in Arizona, and our tickets were pinned to my brother's inside coat pocket. I don't remember much of the trip, but after we reached the segregated southern part of the journey, things must have looked up. Negro passengers, who always traveled with loaded lunchboxes, felt sorry for the poor little motherless darlings, and plied us with cold fried chicken and potato salad. Years later, I discovered that the United States had been crossed thousands of times by frightened black children traveling alone to their newly affluent parents in northern cities, or back to grandmothers in southern towns when the urban north reneged on its economic promises. The town reacted to us as its inhabitants had reacted to all things new before our coming. It regarded us a while without curiosity, but with caution, and after we were seen to be harmless and children, it closed in around us as a real mother embraces a stranger's child. Warmly, but not too familiarly. We lived with our grandmother and uncle in the rear of the store. It was always spoken of with a capital S which she had owned some 25 years. Early in the century, Mama, we soon stopped calling her grandmother, sold lunches to the sawmen in the lumberyard, East Stamps, and the seedmen at the cotton gin, West Stamps. Her crisp meat pies and cool lemonade, when joined to her miraculous ability to be in two places at the same time, assured her business success. From being a mobile lunch counter, she set up a stand between the two points of fiscal interest and supplied the workers' needs for a few years. Then she had the store built in the heart of the Negro area. Over the years, it became the lay center of activities in town. On Saturdays, barbers sat their customers in the shade on the porch of the store, and troubadours on their ceaseless crawlings through the south leaned across its across its benches and sang their sad songs of the Brazos while they played juice harps and cigar box guitars. The formal name of the store was the William Johnson General Merchandise Store. Customers could find food staples, a good variety of colored thread, mash for hogs, corn for chickens, coal, coal oil for lamps, light bulbs for the wealthy, shoestrings, hair, dressings, balloons, and flower seeds. Anything not visible had only to be ordered. Until we became familiar enough to belong to the store and it to us, we were locked up in a fun house of things where the attendant had gone home for life. Each year, I watched the field across from the store turn caterpillar green, then gradually frosty white. I knew exactly how long it would be before the big wagons would pull into the front yard and load on the cotton pickers at daybreak to carry them to the remains of slavery's plantations. During the picking season, my grandmother would get out of bed at four o'clock, she never used an alarm clock, and creak down to her knees and chant in a sleep-filled voice, Our Father, thank you for letting me see this new day. Thank you that you didn't allow the bed lay I lay on last night to be my cooling board, nor my blanket, my winding sheet. Guide my feet this day along the straight and narrow, and help me put a br bridle on my tongue. Bless this house and everybody in it. Thank you. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Before she had quite arisen, she called our names and issued orders and pushed our large feet into homemade slippers and across the bare, lye-washed wooden floor to, the, to light the coal oil lamp. The lamplight in the store gave a soft, make-believe feeling to our world, which made me want to whisper and walk about on tiptoe. The odors of onions and oranges and kerosene had been mixing all night and wouldn't be disturbed until the wooden slat was removed from the door and the early morning air forced its way in with the bodies of people who had walked miles to reach the pickup place. Sister, I'll have two cans of sardines. I'm going to work so fast today, I'm going to make you look like you standing still. Let me have a hunk of cheese and some soda crackers. Just give me a couple of them fat peanut patties. 
That would be a picker who was taking his lunch. That would be from a picker who was taking his lunch. The greasy brown paper sack was stuck behind the bibs of his overalls. He'd used the candy as a sack before the noon sun called the workers to rest. In those tender mornings, the store was full of laughing, joking, boasting, and bragging. One man was going to pick 200 pounds of cotton and another 300. Even the children were promising to bring home faux bits and six bits. The champion picker of the day before was the hero of the dawn. If he prophesied that the cotton in today's field was going to be sparse and stick to the bowl bowls like glue, every listener would grunt a hearty agreement. The sound of the empty cotton sacks dragged over the floor and the murmurs of waking people were sliced by the cash register as we rang up the five cent sales. If the morning sounds and smells were touched with the supernatural, the late afternoon had all the features of the normal Arkansas life. In the dying sunlight, the people dragged rather than their empty cotton sacks. Brought back to the store, the pickers would step out of the, of the backs of trucks and fold down dirt disappointed to the ground. No matter how much they had picked, it wasn't enough. Their wages wouldn't even get them out of debt to my grandmother, not to mention the staggering bill that waited, that waited on them at the white commissary downtown. During these years in stamps, I met and fell in love with William Shakespeare. He was my first white love. Although I enjoyed and respected Kipling, Poe, Kipling, po, Butler, Thackeray, and Henley, I saved my young and loyal passion for Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Langston Hughes, James Weldon Johnson, and W.E.B. Du Bois, Litany at Atlanta. But it was Shakespeare who said, when in disgrace with fortune in men's eyes, it was a state with which I felt myself most familiar. I pacified myself about his whiteness by saying that after all he had been dead so long it couldn't matter to anyone anymore. Bailey and I decided to memorize a scene from The Merchant of Venice, but we realized that Mama would question us about the author and that we'd have to tell her that Shakespeare was white, and it wouldn't matter to her whether he was dead or not. So we chose The Creation by James Weldon Johnson instead. Weighing the half pounds of flour, excluding the scoop, and, dispo and depositing them dust-free into the thin paper sacks held a simple kind of adventure for me. I developed an eye for measuring how full a silver-looking ladle of flour, mash, meal, sugar, or corn had to be pushed to, scale, to push the scale indicator over to eight ounces or one pound. When I was absolutely accurate, our appreciative customers used to admire. Sister Henderson sure got some smart grandchildrens. If I was off in the store's favor, the eagle-eyed woman would say, women would say, put some more in that sack, child, don't you try don't you try to make your profit off of me. Then I would quietly but persistently punish myself. For every bad judgment, the fine was no silver-wrapped kisses, the sweet chocolate drops that I loved more than anything in the world except Bailey, and maybe canned pineapples. My obsession with pineapples nearly drove me mad. I dreamt of the days when I would be grown and, be, and able to buy a whole carton for myself alone. Although the syrupy golden rings sat in their exotic cans on our shelves year-round, we only tasted them during Christmas. Mama used the juice to make almost black fruit cakes. Then she lined heavy soot-encrusted iron skillets with the pineapple rings for rich upside-down cakes. Bailey and I received one slice each, and I carried mine around for hours, shredding off the fruit until nothing was left except the perfume on my fingers. I'd like to think that my desire for pineapples was so sacred that I wouldn't allow myself to steal a can, which was possible, and eat it alone out in the garden, but I'm certain that I must have weighed the possibility of the scent exposing me and didn't have the nerve to attempt it. Until I was 13 and left Arkansas for good, the store was my favorite place to be. Alone and empty in the mornings, it looked like an unopened present from a stranger. Opening the front doors was pulling the ribbon off the unexpected gift. The light would come in softly, we faced north, easing itself over the shelves of mackerel, salmon, tobacco, thread. It fell flat on the big vat of lard, and by noontime during the summer, the grease had softened to a thick soup. Whenever I walked into the store in the afternoon, I sensed that it was tired. I alone could hear the slow pulse of its job half done. But just before bedtime, after numerous people had walked in and out, 
had argued over their bills or joked about their neighbors or just dropped in to give sister henderson a high all the promise of magic mornings returned to the store and spread itself over the family and washed live life waves for nearly a year i sopped around the house the store the school and the church like an old biscuit dirty and inedible then i met or rather got to know the lady who threw me my first lifeline mrs bertha flowers was the aristocrat of black stamps she had the grace of control to appear warm in the coldest weather and on the arkansas summer days it seemed she had a private breeze which she, which swirled around cooling her she was thin without the taut look of wiry people and her printed wild dress dresses and flowered hats were as right for her as denim overalls for a farmer she was our side's answer to the richest white woman in town her skin was a rich black that would have peeled like a plum if snagged but then no one would have thought of getting close enough to mrs flowers to ruffle her dress let alone snag her skin she didn't encourage familiarity she wore gloves too i don't think i ever saw mrs flowers laugh but she smiled often a slow widening of her thin black lips to show even small white teeth, then the slow effortless closing. When she chose to smile on me, I always wanted to thank her. The action was so graceful and inconclusively benign. She was one of the few gentlewomen I have ever known, and has remained throughout my life the measure of what a human being can be. Mama had a strange relationship with her. Most often she passed on the road in front of the store, when she passed on the road in front of the store, she spoke to Mama in that soft yet caring voice. Good day, Mrs. Henderson. Mama responded with, How you, Sister Flowers? Mrs. Flowers didn't belong to our church, nor was she Mama's familiar. Why on earth did she insist on calling her Sister Flowers? Shame made me want to hide my face. Mrs. Flowers deserves better than to be called Sister. Then Mama left out the verb. Why not ask, how are you, Mrs. Flowers? With the unbalanced passion of the young, I hated her for showing her ignorance to Mrs. Flowers. It didn't occur to me for many years that they were as alike as sisters, separated only by formal education. Although I was upset, neither of the women was in the least shaken by what I thought an unceremonious greeting. Mrs. Flowers would continue her easy gait up the hill to her little bungalow, and Mama kept on shelling peas or doing whatever had brought her to the front porch. Occasionally, though, Mrs. Flowers would drift off the road and down to the store, and Mama would say to me, Sister, you go on and play. As I left, I would hear the beginning of an intimate conversation, Mama persistently using the wrong verb, or none at all. Brother and Sister Wilcox is surely the meanest is mama is brother and sister wilcox is surely the meanest is mama is oh please not is mama for two or more but they talked and from the side of the building where i waited for the ground to open up and swallow me I heard the soft-voiced Mrs. Flowers and the textured voice of my grandmother merging and melting. They were interrupting from time to time by, interrupted from time to time by giggles that must have come from Mrs. Flowers. Mama never giggled in her life. Then she was gone. One summer afternoon, sweet milk fresh in my memory, she stopped at the store to buy provisions. Another Negro woman of her well health and age would have been expected to carry the paper sacks home in one hand, but Mama said, Sister Flowers, I'll send Bailey up to your house with these things. She smiled that slow, dragging smile. Thank you, Mrs. Henderson. I'd prefer Marguerite, though. My name was beautiful when she said it. I've been meaning to talk to her anyway. They gave each other age group looks. Mama said, Well, that's all right then. Sister, go and change your dress. You go and know Sister Flowers. The chiffre, the chiffre robe was a maze. What on earth did one put on to go to Mrs. Flower's house? I knew I shouldn't put on a Sunday dress. It might be sacrilegious. 
certainly not a house dress, since I was already wearing a fresh one. I chose a school dress, naturally. It was formal, without suggesting that going to Mrs. Flower's house was equivalent to attending church. I trusted myself back into the store. Now don't you look nice. I had chosen the right thing, for once. Mrs. Henderson, you make most of the children's clothes, don't you? Yes, ma'am, sure do. Store-bought clothes ain't hardly worth a thread. It take to stitch em. I'll say you do a lovely job, though. So neat. That dress looks professional. Mama was enjoying the seldom-received compliments. Since everyone we knew, except Mrs. Flowers, of course, could sew competently, praise was rarely handed out for the commonly practiced craft. I'll try, with the help of the Lord, Sister Flowers, to finish the inside just like I does the outside. Come here, sister. I had buttoned up the collar and tied the belt, apron-like in back. Mama told me to turn around. With one hand, she pulled the strings and the belt fell free at both sides of my waist. Then her large hands were at my neck, opening the button loops. I was terrified. What was happening? Take it off, sister. She had her hands on the hem of the dress. I don't need to see the inside, Mrs. Henderson, I can tell. But the dress was over my head and my arms were stuck in the sleeves. Mama said, that'll do. See here, Sister Flowers. I French seams around the armholes. Through the cloth film, I saw the shadow approach. That makes it last longer. Children these days would bust out of sheet metal clothes. They so rough. That is a very good job, Mrs. Henderson. You should be proud. You can put the dress back on, Marguerite. No, ma'am, pride is a sin, and according to, to the good book, it goeth before fall. That's right, so the Bible says. It's a good thing to keep in mind. I wouldn't look at either of them. Mama hadn't thought that taking off my dress in, my, in front of Mrs. Flowers would kill me stone dead. If I had refused, she would have thought I was trying to be womanish and might have remembered St. Louis. Mrs. Flowers had known that I would be embarrassed, and that was even worse. I picked up the groceries and went out to wait in the hot sunshine. It would be fitting if I got a sunstroke and died before they came outside, just dropped dead on the slanting porch. There was a little path beside the rocky road, and Mrs. Flowers walked in front swinging her arms and picking her way over the stones. She said, without turning her head to me, I hear you're doing very good schoolwork, Marguerite, but that's but that it's all written. The teachers report that they have trouble getting you to talk in class. We passed the triangular farm on our left and the path widened to allow us to walk together. I hung back in the separate and unasked and unanswerable questions. Come and walk along with me, Marguerite. I couldn't have refused even if I'd wanted to. She pronounced my name so nicely, or more correctly, she spoke each word with such clarity that I was certain a foreigner who didn't understand English could have understood her. Now, no one is going to make you talk. Possibly no one can. But bear in mind, language is man's way of communicating with his fellow man. And, it's, and it is language alone which separates him from the lower animals. That was a totally new idea to me. And I, wouldn't need and I would need time to think about it. Your grandmother says you read a lot. Every chance you get, that's good, but not good enough. Words mean more than what is set down on paper. It takes the human voice to infuse them with the shades of deeper meaning. I memorized the part about the human voice infusing words. It seems so valid and poetic. She said she was going to give me some books and that I, and I not only must read them, I must read them aloud. She suggested that I try to make a sentence sound in as many different ways as possible. I'll accept no excuse if you return a book to me that has been badly handled. My imagination boggled at the punishment. I would deserve, if in fact I did abuse a book of Mrs. Flowers, death would be too kind and brief. The odors in the house surprised me. Somehow I had never connected Mrs. Flowers with food or eating or any other common experience of common people. There must have been an outhouse, too, but my mind never recorded it. The sweet scent of vanilla had met us as she opened the door. I made tea cookies this morning. You see, I had planned to invite you for cookies and lemonade so we could have this little chat. The lemonade is in the icebox. It followed that Mrs. Flowers would have 
ice on an ordinary day. When most families in our town bought ice late on Saturdays, only a few times during the summer to be used in the wooden ice cream freezers. She took the bags from me and disappeared through the kitchen door. I looked around the room that I had never in my wildest fantasies imagined I would see. Brown photographs leered or threatened from the walls and white, freshly done, done, done curtains pushed against themselves and against the wind. I wanted to gobble up the room entire and take it to Bailey, who would help me analyze and enjoy it. Have a seat, Marguerite, over there by the table. She carried a platter covered with a tea towel. Although she warned that she hadn't tried her hand at baking sweets for some time, I was certain that, like everything else about her, the cookies would be perfect. They were flat, round wafers, slightly brown on the edges and butter yellow in the center. With the cold lemonade, they were sufficient for childhood's lifelong diet. Remembering my manners, I took nice little ladylike bites off the edges. She said she had made them expressly for me and that she had a few in the kitchen that I could take home to my brother. So I jammed one whole cake in my mouth and the rough crumbs scratched the insides of my jaws. And if I hadn't had to swallow, it would have been a dream come true. As I ate, she began the first of what we later called my lessons in living. She said that I must always be intolerant of ignorance, but understanding of illiteracy. That some people, unable to go to school, were more educated and even more intelligent than college professors. She encouraged me to listen carefully to what country people called mother wit. That in those homely, that in those homely sayings was couched the collective wisdom of generations. When I finished the cookies, she brushed off the table and brought a thick, small book from the bookcase. I had read A Tale of Two Cities and found it up to my standards as a romantic novel. She opened the first page and I heard poetry for the first time in my life. It was the best of times and the worst of times. Her voice slid in and curved down through, the other, over, through and over the words. She was nearly singing. I wanted to look at the pages. Were they the same that I had read? Or were, there, or were there notes, music lined on the pages as a hymn book? Her sounds began cascading gently. I knew from listening to a thousand preachers that she was nearing the end of her reading, and I hadn't really heard, heard to understand, a single word. How do you like that? It occurred to me that she expected a response. The sweet vanilla flavor was still on my tongue, and her reading was a wonder in my ears. I had to speak. I said, yes, ma'am. It was the least I could do, but it was the most also. There's one more thing. Take this book of poems and memorize one for me. Next time you pay me a visit, I want you to recite. I have tried often to search beyond the sophistication of years for the enchantment I so easily found in those gifts. The essence escapes, but, an, but its aura remains. To be allowed no, invited into the private lives of strangers and to share their joys and fears was a chance to exchange the southern bitter wormwood for a cup of mead with Beowulf or a hot cup of tea and milk with Oliver Twist. When I said aloud, it is a far, far better thing to do than I have ever done. Tears of love filled my eyes at my selflessness. On the first day, I ran down the hill and into the road. Few cars ever came along it, and had the good sense to stop running before I reached the store. I was liked, and what a difference it made. I was respected, not as Mrs. Henderson's grandchild or Bailey's sister, but for just being Marguerite Johnson. Childhood's logic never asked to be proved. All conclusions are absolute. I didn't question why Mrs. Flowers had singled me out for attention, nor did it occur to me that Mama might have asked her to give me a little talking to. All I cared about was that she had made tea cookies for me and read to me from her favorite book. It was enough to prove that she liked me. <laughs>